welcome everyone. I'm Phil Massa. I'm still Phil Massacott. <laughs> and thank you for coming today. We are here in the middle of a GROW series, and it's one thing that you can count on coming to this church, that if Phil is speaking, you're going to get a video on small groups. Amen. So I am the life group ministry leader here at this church. And if you're interested in signing up for a life group, you can go and meet me out in the Welcome Center before or after church, or you can go onto our church website at argyle.church throughout the week, and you can sign up and get information right there. So our growth series is designed, we have this in the spring and in the fall, and there's three weeks where we set aside three messages to help bring learning experiences to help us mature in our faith. Now, last week, when you were here, you heard Pastor David bring a message that talked about the Christ follower and all the aspects that they're called to give. And it takes, you're called to give your time, you're called to give your talents, and you're called to give your treasure. Now, this week and next week, we're going to talk about two topics that are linked throughout the Scripture, and that is prayer and fasting. But first, if you've been attending church for any period of time, you're familiar with that little piece of paper that they hand you as you're coming into the church, affectionately known as the church bulletin. Well, that went by the wayside here during the COVID era, but you can find out about our announcements anytime. They're scrolling on the screen before and after church, and you can go onto the, our church website, and they're all listed right there. But when we had them, it was critical that whoever prepared the bulletin for that week, that you had somebody review it before it was printed and distributed because they were full of bloopers. And here's a few examples. First one, at the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be, what is hell? Come early and listen to the choir practice. <laughs> the next one. Next Sunday is the family hayride and bonfire at the Fowlers. Bring your own hot dogs and guns. <laughs> That's either a typo or another church here on the west side. <laughs> and I love this one. Announcement to the Moms Who Care ladies group. There will be no moms who care this week. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Number four, the class on prophecy has been canceled due to unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> and then my personal favorite, during the absence of our pastor, we enjoyed the rare privilege of hearing a good sermon when Reverend Stubbs filled our pulpit. Now, this was not at our church. It was not. No. Just too funny. So, biblical fasting. What is it? If you've been on social media at all recently, you've seen there's a trendy weight loss fads that come and go. And one of them is cyclical fasting where periodically different people tell you, you know, skip a meal, it's good for your health, it'll lower your caloric intake. But that's not what we're talking about today. If you look in the scriptures, there is one command to fast. And that happens all the way at the beginning of the book it was during Moses' time in the 13th century B.C., and so that's approximately 3,300 years ago, and we find the command written in the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. And that verse says, On the tenth day of the seventh month of each year, you must go without eating to show sorrow for your sins. Now, we know the Jewish people today call that day Yom Kippur, or in English, it means the Day of Atonement. And that's where the Jewish high priest was instructed to go and offer a sacrifice on behalf of the sins of the nation of Israel once a year. And the command to everybody in the nation was they had to fast. And so the command was for one day. So the way they practice it, from sundown on one day, 
They went the entire next day to sundown for that 24-hour period with no food and no drink. Now, a couple thousand years ago, they didn't have watches and weather people to tell them what time was sundown. So they would visibly watch and they would start their fast before the sun finished going down. And then just to make sure they went the full day, the next day, they would wait until the sun was completely gone. So they fasted somewhere between 24 and 25 hours. No food, no drink. That's the way it was practiced. And that's the only command in the Bible to fast. And it was to specifically the Hebrew nation. So fasting today is a completely voluntary act for the Christian. It's not a spiritual duty for us to regularly observe like, say, the Lord's Supper, which Jesus commanded us at the last. He commanded his followers at the Last Supper that he wants us to reserve or to observe that regularly in remembrance of him. But that leads us to the question, well, should Christians fast? Well, we're going to take a look and see what the Bible has to say about it. Researching the scriptures, there's 77 instances of fasting in the Bible, and 47 of them are in the Old Testament. And it surprised me, there's 30 references to it in the New Testament. And it's associated with a lot of major figures in the Bible. The first person recorded was Moses, and Samson, and Samuel, and Hannah, King David, Elijah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Daniel, Anna, John the Baptist, and all of his followers, Jesus, Paul, and Barnabas. So you can see there's a lot of people that are very famous in the scriptures that fasted. You say, well, wait a minute, Phil. They're all Jewish. They were commanded in the Old Testament law to fast, and, and that's absolutely true. But there is a lot of evidence through the centuries during the church period of Christians fasting. So I did my favorite reference material. I got on Google and I started looking for fasting. Come to find out the first documented evidence after the church, the Bible period, after the book of Acts, was in the second century, there was a, an early Christian author named Tertullian, and he wrote the first Christian book on fasting. So that was approximately the late 100s. Two centuries later, it's documented for us today that there was a Roman Christian woman named Marcella, and she used to open her home and invite people in for prayer, Bible study, and fasting. And then a century after that, there's this guy named Augustine, whom the city to our south is named after, St. Augustine. He is documented, he wrote many books on fasting, and he himself fasted. And there are many others. Thomas Aquinas, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Wesley, George Whitfield, and in our lifetime, Billy Graham, all fasted and wrote extensively about it. So there's a lot of evidence in the church period of Christians fasting. So you ask yourself, well, what's the purpose of it? Again, we go to the scriptures and we see, oops, it's to take your eyes off the things of this world and focus for a period of time completely on God. That's powerful. And look at some of the reasons in the scriptures why different people fasted. Because there's a lot of different reasons. The first documented fasting in the scriptures was Moses. In Exodus chapter 34 says, Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat food and drink water. He wrote the Ten Commandments. So Moses had this important task, and while he was with God, physically, he fasted. Flash forward a little bit later in the Old Testament, Nehemiah was leading a revival of the Israelite people. And in Nehemiah chapter 9, it says in verse 1, On the 24th day of the seventh month, the people of Israel went without eating. They dressed in sackcloth and threw dirt on their heads to show their sorrow. 
They refused to let foreigners join them as they met to confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors. So as part of their revival, they wanted to restore the tradition and follow the commands written in the book of the law. And Nehemiah and the Israelites prayed and fasted, asking forgiveness of their sins and the sins of their nation. So now flip to the New Testament. We look at the life of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is famously baptized by John the Baptist. And immediately following that, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says this, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now that's got to be the biggest understatement in the, in the world. 40 days with no food, and he was hungry. And then right after this in the scriptures, Jesus begins his three-year earthly ministry. So Jesus went after his baptism to pray and fast for 40 days in preparation of his earthly ministry. Then later in Jesus' ministry, we see this in Matthew chapter 17. It was a failed exorcism. Now, in Jesus' ministry, you're familiar with the 12 disciples that he had. And they were with him constantly, and he was teaching them the entire time. And then about halfway through his ministry, Jesus would empower with them with the power of the Holy Spirit, send them out two by two into local towns and cities without him, and have them perform some of the same miracles that he performed when he was doing his public ministry. And that created teachable moments for the disciples, and then they would share with the crowds that would gather the same teachings that Jesus was teaching them. Well, in this one instance that's recorded for us in Matthew 17, there's a family that brings their child to the disciples, and they were possessed by a demon. And they asked the disciples to cast out the demon. Well, the disciples couldn't do it. So afterwards, they brought the family to Jesus, and Jesus promptly cast the demon out of the child. And then we pick up in verse 19. It says, later the disciples went to Jesus in private and asked them, why couldn't we force out the demon? Jesus replied, it is because you don't have enough faith. But I can promise you this, if you had faith no larger than a mustard seed, you could tell this mountain to move from here to there, and it would. Everything would be possible for you. But the only way to force out that kind of demon is by praying and fasting. So what's Jesus saying here? Well, if you're going to prepare for spiritual battle, then you need to pray and fast and make sure that you are close to God and relying upon his power. Remember, Satan is a fallen angel. And when Satan rebelled, one-third of the angels rebelled with him. And, they are all, and ever since, they've been down here on this earth wrecking havoc amongst and opposing Christian ministries and Christian people all over the world. And that there is a spiritual battle. And if you are serving God and actively recruiting and sharing your faith and doing things for God, you're going to come up against spiritual opposition. And Jesus says, you've got to pray and fast and grow in your faith to be able to deal with those kinds of situations and overcome that type of opposition. And you'll see prayer and fasting are continuously linked. Later in the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas in chapter 14, verse 23, said this, when they had appointed elders for them in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So what's going on here? Well, Paul and Barnabas were sent by their church out to areas to share the gospel where there was no church. And they would share the gospel, people would get saved, they'd gather them together, they would form a church, they would teach them and disciple them for a period of time, and then they would appoint leaders to lead over that church as they moved on to another area. And so 
they would pray and fast for the success of their ministry and for them to be strong and to continue to rely upon the Holy Spirit and to grow in their faith. So, is fasting beneficial to the Christian today? Well, Dr. Billy Graham spent his life, the better part of the last century, going around the world, holding large events where he shared the gospel and literally brought millions of people to be Christ followers. And then in between those events, he would go to different conferences and teach church leaders, pastors all over the world. And in one particular instance, he taught on fasting. And Dr. Billy Graham said this, so where does that leave us, the modern followers of Jesus? Where does fasting fit into our lives? Excellent question. At the very least, this cursory glance that we've taken into the subject suggests that it is central to our relationship with God. And in the same way that time with God, prayer, and time in the Word, the Bible, are crucial to our spiritual development, this discipline fasting is key to our spiritual growth. So when someone is that successful in their Christian ministry, we should understand where his power came from. And he's telling us right here. Prayer, Bible study, and fasting. So whether it's an important task like Moses had, whether it's you want to spend more time with God and have a closer relationship with Him, whether you want to repent of sin or overcome and be able to set up guardrails to prevent you from future sin, or God has called you to a specific ministry and you need to prepare for that, or you're in the midst of spiritual warfare, or you just simply want to increase in your faith or pray and fast for others who are involved in any of these things. It is absolutely beneficial to the Christian today to fast. Now, Jesus also taught about fasting. In the book of Matthew, we have a full-length sermon by Jesus recorded for us in Matthew's five, six, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And in chapter 6, it says this, what not to do. Jesus said in verse 16, whenever you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting is obvious to people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, so that your fasting isn't obvious to others, but to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So Jesus here was obviously referring to the religious leaders of that time. And in this section, he talked not only about don't be hypocritical about fasting, but he also linked it to prayer and giving. And he said these people were standing there Ah, oh, Lord, thank you for my fasting. And look how spiritual I am, people. And he says, no, 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 no. Don't be a hypocrite. God knows they were doing it for public adoration. He says, do it privately so that when you are not a hypocrite. And then notice in the passage, Jesus said, if, didn't say if you fast, he said to his followers, when you fast. So he assumed his followers would be doing it and that it would be beneficial to them. So this topic really hit home with me. I had never fasted. And I mean, in the, in the mid-80s, I went to three years of seminary, prepared for full-time Christian ministry, and I honestly can't remember one lecture or one teaching session on fasting and that discipline. Now, I'll be honest, I was working full-time at night, going to school full-time in the day, and we were starting our family. So I might have slept through a couple of lectures. <laughs> but when our life group, the beginning of this year, we began a new study, we studied the Sermon on the Mount. 
And when we got to chapter 6 and that passage on fasting uh, in particular, the Holy Spirit really spoke to me and pricked my heart about fasting. And then a couple months later when we were preparing for this Grow series, the Holy Spirit started speaking to me again about fasting. So that led to this. And while I was preparing this message, because we picked our topics more than a month ago, the Holy Spirit started talking to me. He's like, you can't be a hypocrite and get up there and teach on fasting and have never fasted yourself. So I determined in my heart at that point, well, I'm going to fast. And I was going to follow the Jewish biblical practice of 24 hours. So I approached my wife and I told her what I wanted to do. Well, my wife is a nurse and she goes, wait a minute, you're a diabetic. You can't fast. What's that going to do to your blood sugar? So, but I said, well, I'm thinking to myself, the Holy Spirit was the one telling me to do this. And so she dutifully, when I fasted, she measured my blood sugar all day long and we watched it drop throughout the day. No, it never dropped to dangerous levels, so it was okay. But it led me to think, well, are there health concerns with fasting? So I did research it, and I found this written by the American Diabetes Association. It said, if blood glucose stays low for too long, starving the brain of glucose, it may lead to seizures, coma, and very rarely death. I thought, ooh, that's not good. So if you have a health condition, you need to be smart. God has given you a brain. He's given you wisdom and godly knowledge. And follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. There is no command today where you have to fast for any particular period of time. I simply followed what the Jews followed and probably the Orthodox Jews even today. But it could be what God knows your heart and whatever period of time you set aside to stop doing whatever you're doing. Typically, it's the preparation of a meal, eating the meal, cleaning up, and setting that side of time to prayer and Bible study. God's going to honor that. So if you have a health condition, just be smart about it. I also found an article on February 17, 2023, a 39-year-old pastor from Mozambique died on Wednesday after attempting to replicate Jesus Christ's biblical accomplishment of fasting for 40 consecutive days straight without food and water. He died on day 25. And then right below that article, the year before in 2022, there was a South African pastor that attempted the same thing, and he also died and there were others. So the only two recorded instances in the scriptures of someone fasting for 40 days was Moses in Exodus when he was physically with God. And then Jesus himself who was God before he began his ministry. So I would recommend to you, if you fast, you follow the practice of the traditional Jewish Hebrew fast of 24 hours. Because remember, however long you fast, what is the purpose? To focus on God and to take that time when you would spend doing other things and talk more to God and to read His Word and to pray. Every time in that day, I'll, I'll tell you, it was hard. Well, every time I felt hunger and thirst, it reminded me of why I was doing it, to draw closer to God. And it can be that same thing for you. So ask yourselves, do you want to grow spiritually? God has laid it out. Talk with him, read his word, and consider fasting. Throughout Scripture, the people of God repeatedly observe the practice of fasting, a time set aside to abstain from food so that they might lean further 
into God. As the practice of fasting was a means of God's grace to his people then, it is still a means of grace for his people today. When trials weigh us down, fasting reminds us to pray. The hunger of our bodies reminds us to pray for wisdom in the challenges we face. It reminds us to pray for strength, that we could endure the obstacles ahead of us. And it reminds us to pray for God's deliverance, because we know it's not the things of this world that will ultimately deliver us, but God. And when tragedy interrupts our lives, fasting invites us to bring our grief to God. The groans of our hungry body join together with the groans of our soul, crying out for God's restoration. And these physical needs are an opportunity to express our spiritual needs, saying, Lord, we need you to comfort us, and we trust that you will. When temptation threatens to pull us into sin, fasting strengthens us to live for righteousness. Our hunger serves as a constant reminder to resist the devil and draw near to God. As our body aches, we recall the mortality of our flesh and we turn to God in dependence, acknowledging our weakness because his strength is made perfect in weakness. In every temptation, tragedy, and trial, fasting is an opportunity for every Christian to live out the words of Scripture. Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So thank you all for coming today. So to end our service today, our third um, song is going to be a music video that has been, it spoke a lot to me over the years. In 1972, a band formed in the Midwest coming out of the Jesus movement of the late 60s and early 70s called Petra. Petra meaning the Greek word for rock. And this band has recorded music and released albums for the past 52 years. This year they're doing their final, final reunion tour and then they're retiring. And actually they were in Orange Park a couple of months ago. And they released a song in 1990 called Prayer. And this is our prayer today. So now it was released in 1990. The video quality is not what you expect today and are familiar with all the high definition. But listen to the words as they sing this song. So at the end of the song, you are dismissed. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Go in peace and love and serve the Lord this week. Here's Petra.
evidence of what your grace can do to a generation struggling to find themselves in you. May they come to know the love of God. May their eyes be made to see. Give me the opportunity to share the truth that sets them free. And may you not see in all things. Be the banner of your church. And let revival's fire begin to burn. Begin to burn. Face the 